as opposed to separate property? Well, in a nutshell, what you owned at the time you got married mm -hmm. and what you acquired after you got married by way of a gift or an inheritance. Mm -hmm. And the income and appreciation on those properties is your separate property. Now, this is in California, folks. So. Correct. Uh, <laughs> or in community property states, which California is the uh, largest. Well, it part. seems like there, I've seen anomalies between them, and that's right. part of the reason why I mentioned no, this, it. This is, if you're outside of the state of California, mm -hmm. this part is, is going to be kind of wasted on you. Um, everything else is pretty much community property. Your earnings, the interest in income, dividends, capital gains off of your earnings. Now, that's a very simplified description of it. For example, if the uh, surviving spouse, excuse me, if uh, the man marries a second time, uh, it doesn't have to be the man, but it often is, and he's got a business that he runs, a right. sole proprietorship, a closely held business, and uh, he usually plows back into the business uh, monies that would fairly compensate for him for his labor. In other words, if, uh, if a, lawyer, a lawyer or a non-lawyer, for example, who a professional was making should be paid $200,000 a year for the value of his labor, but he's putting it all back into the business, that even though he owned that business before he got married, when he died, that part of that business will be deemed to be community prop uh, separate property, and part of it will be community property. Okay. You might say, well, how can that be? He had the business before he married this woman. Uh, the courts basically say that, well, yeah, but he's, he's laboring for the benefit of the community in this business, but he's not taking out the salary that would fairly compensate him for his labor. Mm -hmm. So therefore, by definition, the community estate has a right of reimbursement from the uh, separate property business for the value of his community property labor. Um, this almost makes it sound as though you've got to go to uh, divorce lawyers after mm -hmm. one spouse dies mm -hmm. to figure out what's community and what's separate. Um, that's a bit of an overstatement, but not too much. Mm -hmm. uh, often the surviving spouse won't realize that she has a community property interest in her husband's uh, premarital business mm -hmm. until after she sees a lawyer thereafter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. Now let's talk a little bit about the trust that you were mentioning earlier. So uh, the nickname we have for it in the estate planning community is the Q-tip. Uh, the Q-tip, uh, which stands for Qualified Terminal Interest Property Trust, uh, was an outgrowth of the 1981 Economic Recovery Tax Act, which mm -hmm. lawyers call ERTA. Mm -hmm. uh, Q-tip uh, was just a, a cute uh, way of describing something that we all are familiar with. It's not had nothing to do with the kind that cleans out your uh -huh. ears. But uh -huh. uh, what it was designed to do is say this. Uh, uh, under the estate tax law, and by the way, folks, we don't have an estate tax law right now because uh, the president and the legislative branch can't seem to get together. Our state tax laws expired at the end of last year. 19, excuse me, 2009. 2009. So that so. theoretically, if you pass away this year, there's no estate tax. Right. But there's the supposition, the belief that eventually they will re they will uh, reenact the estate tax law, and it'll be similar to something we had before. But under the old estate tax law, uh, the taxes were 35 to 55 percent on your estate, but there was a, a big deduction called the marital deduction. Right. And that meant that it went to the extent it went from the first spouse to die to the surviving spouse, it went tax free. Prior to 1982, the property either had to go outright to the surviving spouse or she had to have what's called a general testamentary power of appointment on her death that said when she died, whatever she hadn't already spent, she would have the right to appoint it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, but then in 1981, when they enacted ERTA, they came up with a trust that would satisfy the unlimited marital deduction in which she would not have the power to leave it to anybody else. Uh, it would basically be a trust in which she would be entitled to the income automatically. And by income, I mean the interest and the dividends, not capital gains, which is generally speaking considered to be principal, but the interest and the dividends. She could live off of that. And then when she died, it could go automatically to the children. She would not have any power to dispose of it. And uh, what that did was not only defer the estate tax uh, on the Q-tip trust until after the surviving spouse died, uh, didn't really save taxes, it just deferred them, but it also basically uh, limited her rights to prevent the children by the prior marriage from inheriting something else. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, was, it accomplished two things. It deferred estate taxes. It was a very common vehicle for doing that. And it basically uh, 
helped, uh, the, word, the word I'm searching for is something other than the word assured or insured. It didn't insure anything. Mm -hmm. But it was supposed to protect a future inheritance for the children by the prior marriage uh, because the surviving spouse couldn't give it to her children by another marriage or give it to her third husband for that matter. So if I have a Q-tip trust that I make in my trust uh, and, I, and I pass away, basically what it means is my spouse gets the benefit of that property during her lifetime. Mm -hmm. And then, but ultimately, I control where that property is going to go, and presumably right. as to my children. In a, in a traditional, or I shouldn't say traditional, a common Q-tip trust, um, when the husband died, he would make his wife, the surviving spouse, the trustee. Mm -hmm. And of the trust, she's supposed to pay herself the interest in the dividends. Often, the trust will give her a power to invade the principal mm -hmm. for uh, her reasonable support, care, maintenance. Mm -hmm. But then when she dies, uh, a child would become the successor trustee and they distribute it among the children by the prior marriage. That's a fairly traditional uh, type of uh, estate planning tool. Okay. Now, how does a Q-tip work in practice? Well, the problem with Q-tips in particular and trusts in general is this. Uh, trusts were enacted because people uh, were saying, oh, I don't want to have to go through probate. I don't want to have to hire a lawyer. I don't have to probate a will. And in a trust, theoretically, you don't. Uh, if the trust uh, properties have been titled in the name of the trust, then all you need is a death certificate to take down to the bank or the brokerage company, uh, record as an affidavit uh, death of trustee with, against the real estate, and the successor trustee automatically takes over. Mm -hmm. They then have the power to go ahead and do anything they want to with the property. Mm -hmm. Now, you notice, Mike, I said power, yes. not right. Okay. Because the rights they have are spelled out in the trust. But unless there's somebody there to enforce those rights who knows what's going on, the surviving spouse often has the power to do anything she wants to. She could theoretically go ahead and uh, sell everything and spend it on whatever she wants. Mm -hmm. Now, that would be a breach of her fiduciary duty as trustee. But uh, who's going to sue her? Mm -hmm. Well, the only ones that could sue her would be the children by the prior marriage who would otherwise have received the property. But if they go ahead and sue her, even if they win, then she has to put the money back in the trust, assuming you can get it. Yes. She hasn't already spent it, and they still don't get it until after she passes away. Mm -hmm. uh, another common problem is that um, um, when the children are the trustee, oh yeah, uh, that's an even worse dilemma because sometimes the father will make a child the trustee, mm -hmm. and of course the child will sometimes just not give her any of the income at all. Well, that would be pretty upsetting. Which would be very upsetting <laughs> to the widow. So. Because people don't have to go to a lawyer to be exercise these powers, therefore they think that uh, they can do anything they want to with it, and they often do. Uh, you know, by the way, a common situation that I forgot to tell you about is uh, involving husbands. Remember that generally a, a husband and wife, when they go in to do estate planning, even with it's the first marriage, they'll do a Q-tip trust. Mm -hmm. But then if the wife dies and the husband remarries, his second spouse will often be concerned about, is he going to provide for her welfare? Right. And so he will set up a trust of himself, basically leaving everything to her. Now, guess what he puts into that trust? Everything. Everything, <laughs> including the stuff that was supposed to go to his children by his prior marriage when he died. Now, is that a breach of trust? Yes. yes. So often you might have a situation where the children by the first marriage wind up suing the second spouse because she wound up getting everything that was supposed to have been held for their benefit. Right. Now, why wouldn't a survivor do what he or she is supposed to do? Well, let me tell you something. Um, if I'm a wife marrying a man in the second half of his life, I'm not getting any bargain. I mean, I may be marrying a man that has 10 times my money, but being a man who's himself in the second half of his life, Mike, I know that getting a man in the second half of his life is no bargain for the woman. <laughs> we're irascible, we're difficult, uh, we may be more financially generous because we can, but in other respects, we're kind of losers in that respect. And often the wife, I don't like to think uh, of myself that way, but 